Welcome to the book show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. Stuart Onan's latest, Ocean State, is a beautifully written and compelling novel about sisters, mothers, and daughters, and the terrible things love makes us do. In the first line of Ocean State, we learn that a high school student was murdered, and we find out who did it. The story that unfolds from there, with incredible momentum, is thus one of the build-up to and fallout from the murder, told through the alternating perspectives of the four women at its heart. Angel and Bertie love the same teenage boy frantically and single-mindedly and are compelled by the intensity of their feelings to extremes neither could have anticipated. Stuart Onan paints a fully realized portrait of these women, but also weaves a compelling and heartbreaking story of working class life in Ashaway, Rhode Island. Stuart is the author of 20 books, including Wish You Were Here, Everyday People, Songs for the Missing, and one of my favorite novels of all time, Last Night at the Lobster. It is a great pleasure to welcome Stuart Onan to this week's book show. How are you, sir? Very well, Joe. Thanks for having me back on. It's wonderful to have you back on, and I look forward to uh, talking about this novel. What brought you to this particular place? And I'm interested in uh, in sort of all of the possible connotations to that question, one being the the geography of it, as well as the idea of teenagers and young love and ultimately a murder mystery. Well, first it was, it was based on a, a real-life murder that happened in a small Connecticut river town, uh, Haddam, Connecticut, uh, back when I was living in Connecticut about 15 years ago. And there was a young woman, 13 years old, named Mary Ann Measles, who had wanted to ingratiate herself with this other group of teens. And she thought the way to do it was to sleep with the boys in the group. And the girls in the group took exception to that and convinced the boys uh, to kill her. Um, and together... Uh, I think it was a group of four of them. Uh, they killed her and shoved her in an oil drum and threw her off a bridge into the Connecticut River. I, I'd read a lot about the case and about Marianne's family and her mother uh, and her sisters. And I, I just kept trying to find a way in to write about that town and, and those people. And I guess uh, about two years ago at the beginning of COVID, it kind of clicked that I could find a way in through the younger sister. And not the sister of Marianne, the victim, but the sister of one of the killers. Um, and I thought, okay, that could be very interesting if your role model in life, your idol really, turns out to be a terrible person. What happens then to you? How do you deal with that? How do you, how do you deal with the love for that person and, and the, the adoration? And so as I began to write at the very beginning of COVID, we were in you know, semi-full lockdown. We couldn't really leave or go or travel anywhere. And so rather than set it in the small Connecticut river town of Haddam, I moved it over to Rhode Island, which I know better because my wife's family comes from there. So I spent a lot of time in those small river towns like Ashaway, Rhode Island, um, and down near Westerly and down along the shore there at Musquamacan Beach. I, I had that familiar you know, place that anchored me that I could work with so that I didn't have to do much research. It's one of the, the first books I've, maybe the first book I've ever written that didn't involve sort of heavy duty location scouting. So with that behind you, the idea to, as I mentioned in the introduction, tell us right up front what's happening with that a student is murdered and we know who did it. Obviously, that's by choice. And then the rest of the novel or, or you know, a good 75% of it is sort of getting us to the point of the murder and learning about these young women. Yeah, I always think that in mysteries, usually the mystery is more interesting than the solution. Um, the solution is usually a letdown. I think Chandler was one of the first people to say that, actually. And so I thought, you know, it's the how, it's the why, um, and it's also, in, in the back end of the book, the consequences we often see these grand gestures and these terrible things happen, but we really see the characters have to live with the consequences. And I really wanted to do that. Um, but in terms of the sisters, uh, that, that relationship there between Marie and Angel, I started looking at Shirley Jackson's uh, We've Always Lived in the Castle. Because um, mm -hmm. I just started thinking about those New England books and what if you're part of a family in the small town, there's nowhere to hide in a small town. And what if the small town sort of you know, ostracizes you and, and everyone sees every move that you make and is just picking it apart. And then on top of that, you know, it's set in 2009 and 
social media is is booming. So you know every move you make as sort of a teenager or a high schooler is picked apart by your peers as well. And then just anonymous trolls online. And I thought that pressure could could really work, you know, to bring forth the characters. In looking at this world of teenagers fighting over a guy, you you look at the angst of that, the drama of being in high school, and you do so in a very matter of fact way, and and almost like oh, you know you you know how it is, uh, and and it's a very interesting tone to take. We do know how it is in a way, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's teen love, so the melodrama is cranked really, really, really high. But it's also very, very common in everyone's you know in, in high school. Everyone's kind of going through it. There, everyone is either you know in love or ostracized or part of the group or not. Who's included? You know, who's up? Who's down? You know, who's popular? It's that, it's that fishbowl I was looking for there. And there's even before it happens, there's nowhere for either Birdie or Angel to hide. Tell us a little bit about Angel and Birdie. As I mentioned in the introduction, they love the same kid, Miles, and they eventually know about each other, and and that is is really the driver here. Uh, we should note that Miles has money, and the the girl who's ultimately accused of of uh, of killing the other girl. Um, does not. So there's, there is the, the social class that you look at as well. Yeah. And, and Angel is, you know, she's from the wrong side of the track. She's, you know, her single mom is trying to keep things together. Um, and she's in with the popular crowd because she's good looking, she's athletic, um, but she doesn't get good grades. Her family doesn't have any money. She knows that this senior year is basically going to be her last good year. In a way, um, she is going to lose miles. She says that in the book several times. She is going to lose miles. You know, by the end of the school year, miles is, is heading off to college. His family has money. They expect him to go to college, carry on with the family business. Um, and they are wealthy. Um, they're not, they don't just have money. They have money like house on the beach money. Um, and so every time that they, they have their romantic get togethers at this house, it's a, it's a reminder of what she's going to lose. She knows she's going to. And now Birdie comes into the picture, um, who's young and pretty and basically steals Miles away from her. And she, she can't stand that. So it's a bit, it's a bit about uh, possession, I guess. The idea that love sometimes possesses us and makes us do things that we, we shouldn't do. And um, sometimes we become possessive of those that we love and can't let them go, even though we know they're already gone. We mentioned this at the beginning, but that first line that I that I mentioned is from Marie. And and tell us about Marie because this is one of the voices who is telling us this story, and it's a fascinating perspective because it's a younger sister. It's a younger sister, so she's a bit of an innocent. Um, she is she is not like Angel. She is not pretty. She is not popular. She's not social. She's not athletic. Um, she is an observer in a way. She sits back and she's a judge in a way. And she she mentioned that early on that you know she's judging every unkindness that she sees people do to one another, um, which is perfect for the story. Um, and that first line of the book is when I was in eighth grade, my sister helped kill another girl. So immediately we know. This is retrospective. And the question is, where is Marie telling this to us from? Um, and the why, that compulsion to tell, this is something that's happened to her that she will never quite make sense of, but she has to continually try to do that. So the retrospective narrator works in the way that it worked in, say, my first novel, Snow Angels, mm. where Arthur is looking back at this terrible season where everything goes wrong. And uh, Dennis Lehane, one of my favorite writers, and I, te I teach with him sometimes, he says, let the bad thing happen. Right. Um, and in this case, as in Snow Angel's case, the bad thing happens and then even more bad things happen after that. And Marie seems the right person to carry that story forward into some present where she can then tell it and ask the reader, I can't make sense of this. Can you? Stuart Onan is our guest on this week's book show. The name of the new novel is Ocean State. Marie tells us in the novel, quote, my mother's talent was finding new boyfriends and new places for us to live. Uh, that's that is a, a fairly damning yet true assessment. And, and things are sort of going downhill in that department. 
Carol, their mother, uh, she tries. She tries very hard. She works at a nursing home. Um, she doesn't make a whole lot of money. Um, she drinks a fair amount. Uh, her relations uh, with her husband are, are, you know, they've been divorced now for, I think, eight or nine years. Um, they kind of get along, uh, but they understand that what they had is over. Uh, neither of them has very much in the world. Um, all Carol has is her family. Um, she has her mother, uh, Angel and Marie's grandmother, who doesn't quite agree with all the choices that she's made in life and sees her as a bit of a failure. Um, and so Carol is always kind of fighting against that. And also living in a town that is right next to a resort town uh, where rich people like Miles' family have houses right on the beach. Um, she's surrounded by this wealth um, and she, she just, it, it seems unreachable to her. And so she finds uh, her newest partner, um, Russ, who seems to have some money. And so she wonders if it would make sense for her to remarry or to be with him so that he can sort of help her monetarily. At the same time, feels very guilty about that as if she's, I think she's very aware that she's using him mm. in a way. Um, and she's still involved with her past boyfriend, Wes, who is, you know, a, a lobsterman and just kind of a, you know, a wild boy still. Um, so she's, she's, could have caught she's stuck and doesn't quite know what to do she's always looking for an escape and i think that that word came out to me again and again when i was doing revisions on it's like oh my gosh here's another mention of the word escape uh because everybody wants to get the hell out of there <laughs> <laughs> and so i was like okay tone it down there um but this is where they have to face who they really are they have to face what kind of people that they really are all this all this brings up their true character to the surface and they have to deal with one another. And I think, I think Carol acquits herself rather well in the end. She tries, she does everything that she can do to do what's right for her family and the people closest to her. I was going to say that to you, that Carol comes off as, as not a bad mother and a, and a very attentive and, and caring nurse as well. She just doesn't have the resources that, that that she needs to take care of her two girls there, and that that lack I think, and that the knowing that lack, having a sense that they do lack those opportunities, uh, really sort of grinds them down. It, it it leads them into some some bad choices and desperate choices. You chose two thousand and nine as the time frame for the novel. What was it about that particular time? Was it because of the original crime? No, I, I chose that because I knew it had to be in the past, but not the distant past. Uh, this is the past that is still kind of alive and still kind of present. So I wanted it to be about 10 years into the past from when I was writing. Um, and then I thought about the, the crash, the economic crash of 2008, and how that tied in with the earlier crash that led to Ashaway and the mill that they live next door um, failing and, and sort of falling down now. So that idea of that downward mobility, which I think comes up in a lot of my work. I think it, it's, it's probably inside of me because of growing up in Pittsburgh and, you know, and mm. seeing the town sort of empty out um, after the mills here closed down. Um, so, I mean, uh, industrial, post-industrial Rhode Island is that way. Um, so I figured that that kind of made sense So 2009. And then once I had actually set it there, I found a whole lot more there to sort of dig up. And uh, one of the, the things that really helped me with this was I found yearbooks um, from high schools around that area, including the Westerly High School yearbook from 2009. And so that, that really sort of transported me back. And, and the one that I found, um, uh, it, was, it was a girl's and some all of her friends had written her, you know, very personal notes throughout the book. So I, I got the, I got the slang, I got the cadence, I got the music, I got everything that they were into back then. And that was a lot of fun. Also, it was, uh, it was the first year of uh, Obama's presidency, uh, which is kind of interesting to work with. Absolutely. Uh, especially, especially when I have a, the grandmother is a, a big Rush Limbaugh fan. So <laughs> they have to kind of tread lightly around her politically. <laughs> Miles is interesting to me because he doesn't seem as much of an interest to you in the sense of, okay, he's established, he's the rich kid. It's really the girls who are looking at him um, and are in their own ways fighting over him and the fact that really both are better than this guy. Well, they don't Miles really is, deserve him. Miles, Miles is the prize. He doesn't really deserve them. Right. Um, uh, but of course, I mean, working in point of view, 
Um, so we see Birdie's point of view and her view of Miles is very different from, of course, Angel's point of view of Miles, which is very different from Carol, the mother's point of view of Miles, which is very different from Marie's point of view of Miles. So all of them project something onto him there. And, and they see in him, they, they see, I guess, the ease of life that could be. Uh, Miles plays guitar. He drives a fast car. He has, you know, everybody loves him. He's a very likable guy. Um, he's not a jerk. Everything comes easily to Miles. But for the, the the girls, for the women, he is he is simply the prize. When it comes to the the actual trial and so forth, that's that's mostly off stage, right? You're not as interested in that as to what got us there and what the repercussions later are. Oh, no, no. We, we definitely have, you know, just the choice of the lawyer is, is such a huge, huge thing that Carol is tasked with. Carol does not have the resources to hire no. a lawyer that is going to really make a difference. Um, and so she has to rely on everybody around her, which she hates. Um, she wants to be self-reliant. Um, she hates that some, someone, especially a male, has to come and rescue her. And it, 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 it irks her in a way. Um, and the... The lawyer seems to have he, he's been down this road. He he seems to know what's going to happen before it happens. And he's he's had many, many cases. He's older. He's expensive. And and yet it's you know, this is pretty much what you're looking at. This is the best I can do. He's, he's extremely realistic and he's a guy that knows the courts in and out. He has a plan um, and they they have to trust him. Um, and, and which is difficult to do, especially when, you know, Angel's life is or at least, you know, her livable life is, is on the line. So it's really, really hard making that decision. And then just having I mean, when you have somebody in the system that you, you've given up all power, you just you have to just hope and get through it and go go through it day by day, uh, which is very, very hard. For her. Um, but but we do we do get the courts. We do get you know a little bit of the penal system afterwards. Um and, and the inequities that are there, and I hope they're drawn realistically. They seem to be drawn very realistically in the sense that the richer of the two gets a lighter sentence. But also that at least um, Carol's family, they are matter-of-fact about it. They have had trouble before. They've been in trouble before. They've, they've been in debt before. They've been in the courts before. Um, they're like, okay, this is what we have to do. Um, there's not a lot of gnashing and wailing and, and all that. They're like, okay, this is the next step. And we have to deal with this right now. And we have to deal with it head on as best we can and just and hang on. And, and they try to do that. You seem to, in writing about the, the crime itself, we get drips and drabs, right? You haven't set this up to the a great chapter of the gritty details of what happened at that moment. Of the death. No, I, I try to sketch those in as best I can. Um, and I, I mean, it's something that none of them really wants to think about. Uh, Angel is beset by it, I guess. I mean, she, she can't get rid of it. Um, so it comes to her again and again and again and again. And, and she has to make sense of it, too, because she doesn't quite understand everything that happened there. Um, although she knows in some sense that, that or she feels that it's all her fault. There are a couple of moments in the novel where those two characters, um, Miles and Angel, they, I mean, they could, they could leave. They could just go. And, and that is something that they think of, but obviously never do. I, I think that they know that they've ruined everything. Um, Miles doesn't quite know his own mind. Uh, I, I think a lot of this has been Angel trying to win him back somehow and make it the two of them against the world again, and, and she succeeds in that. And so, in some sense, the killing does bring them back together, which was her hope. Um, but I think it, it ruins everything that was good and easy and free at, at the heart of what they had. And it becomes almost a, almost a role that they end up playing uh, after, you know, after they're, they're bailed out. Um, and they're awaiting trial and they're trying to see each other and the families are trying to keep them apart. Um, and and it, it seems to me that it's it's almost a romantic view hmm. that they both have about the situation that they're in. Um, and that keeps them going until the trial and until they're they're incarcerated. 
You do such a beautiful job humanizing the story. Is that ever a challenge, especially when you're talking about teenagers and, well, ultimately murder? Yeah, yeah. Is it a question of you know what, what kind of person would who would do this and who, right. who would do this this terrible, terrible thing um, to another you know, perfectly lovely person? I mean, uh, but it, but it is, and that's always the the challenge and the. I guess why I, I try to write it, try to figure it out. I mean, that's that's certainly why Marie is trying to go over all these events and try to, you know, put these, you know, why why did this happen? Why did it have to happen this way? Um, and the reason is because these are the people that they are, and, and that's what I have to find out in the writing and discover that in the writing. And I, I think I think I did. Oh, um, yeah. I, I, I hope so. Um, I, I certainly discovered exactly who Marie is. I know that in carrying the story, she reveals so much of herself. I think, uh, I think Miles is always going to be a little bit of a mystery um, because Marie can't imagine herself into his mind. She can't do that. It's impossible for her. Um, she just does not have that level of insight. Well, it seems like you achieve that beautifully because the story is told through multiple voices. And those voices really give us a sense of the the kaleidoscope of things that are happening in this particular situation well thanks well i i hope so i mean i'm always interested in what is foremost on my character's mind what, what is driving them just through the through the days and through the hours and, and how time moves for them and, and who are the people closest to them and, and how are those relationships sometimes difficult and sometimes impossible when you look at what kind of story you're going to take on do you have to be ready to to write about murder to write about something that is just just sort of by its definition going to be a downer um well you know most of my books are not like you know the <laughs> the, the happiest the sparkling, right yeah, yeah it, they're not the sing-along rom-com of the summer usually um they're they're people that are going going through some difficult things and, and have to find the strength um, and the faith to endure what they're going through. And I, I've, I've focused on that, I think, now for probably the last seven or eight books. And you know, not just the events that happen, but then what happens afterwards? And how, do we, how do we continue on? How do you go on? Um, and that may just be me you know, growing older and trying to think of, you know, how do people do this? How do they endure? Because people have to go through a really, really hard. Everyone has to go through really, really hard stuff. I mean, we lose the people that are closest to us, um, and we have to keep going. And we really see that in this particular novel. We really see that from Marie's perspective as the younger sister. Well, Marie, uh, you know, being being the sensitive one, being the recording angel, um, she she knows that she's lost everything. Everything has changed. So, I mean, she has some small, small part in what happens, but really none of it is her fault. But so her world kind of is not quite destroyed, but changed irrevocably there. But her soul is not destroyed. Is that a decision that you make too? How much it's going to affect a certain character? Well, you, you, you have to feel your way to that. You have to, to understand, you know, how is this character reacting to this and what do they do and, and how do they go on? I was thinking of um, Lindsay in uh, Songs for the Missing there. Um, Lindsay in that book she seems the weakest character. She seems the, the flimsiest character. And in the end, she turns out to be the strongest character. But she has to basically separate herself from her past and her family and everything that's happened to them to become this other person, which is awful. Um, and yet she does it. And those are the kind of discoveries that I'll, I, you hope you'll find in the, the back half of a book. Um, with a first person, maybe because it's so intimate and so close, they, they seem to come... Um, maybe more naturally or more, they sort of bubble up in the writing of the voice um, and, and the attitude toward what's happened. One of the things I think you also do beautifully here is that you you make us obviously care about these characters, but also wanting to protect them, wanting them not to, to go down the road they're going down. They care about one another. Yeah. Um, even though there's hard feelings between them sometimes, the, the family really does rally around Angel there. Um, and, and Birdie's family, of course, cared for her deeply. 
there. And there's this, this great hurt, I think, on, on, on both sides, but even more so on Bertie's family. So the fact that they're, they're trying to do the best for one another and sometimes sacrificing uh, for one another, I, I think that, that makes them admirable characters. I, I wouldn't call them exemplary characters, but when it comes time to stand up for one another, they do. When you think of what is going to happen, and, and as you know, as I said, there's that first line. How much then do you know how it's going to be set up with the with the four main chapters and the four mini chapters? Yeah, I, I wasn't really sure how that was going to work out, and also the the, the switching between, say, Angel and Birdie, um, and and the the decision to leave Miles out of the equation. Um, yeah, and that that all came in just the writing of the drafts and, and and you know sometimes putting sections next to each other that are tonally a little bit different or sometimes that match each other or you have those places where um, the main characters connect and clash so you're always looking for those places where you know, your main character is going to be on stage in conflict with one another um, and, and you want to sort of string them out so they're not all jammed up against each other yeah and this goes back to an earlier point, but it, it often seems that you certainly have those moments of conflict, but you do such a complete job of getting us to understand what got us to that conflict. Well, I, I hope so. And I, I think it's pretty simple. I mean, these two teenage girls, you know, are in love with the same guy. It's, it's you know, that the love triangle that turns into sort of a revenge murder. I also wanted to write a book that was about, I want to say, the, the ecstasies of romantic love. Mm. I mean, Birdie is, she is ecstatically in love. She can't wait to see Miles, just to see him. That passion, that comes through in her. It is a lot about, the, again, the, that ecstasy. Uh, and then there's, there's the misery of love as well. And then that, that commingling of it that, that happens in, in Birdie when they break apart and they get back together and they break apart and they can't, they can't stay away from each other. Again, Stuart Arnand's new novel is Ocean State. It is published by Atlantic Monthly Press. We enjoy hearing from our listeners about our shows. You can email us at book at wamc.org and you can listen again to this or find past book shows via podcast or at wamc.org. Sarah LeDuc produces our program Bookmark Us for next week. And thanks for listening for The Book Show. I'm Joe Donahue.